minds in general. Imagine a map of mind design space. A tiny little circle contains all human minds. This is inside transhuman mind space, which includes all the human possibilities as a strict subset. This is inside post-human mind space, which is, you might say, is everything a transhuman might grow up into. And then there's all the rest of mind design space, the, the space of minds in general, including AIs so strange they aren't even recognizably post-human. And we need to pull out, reach into this enormously vast space of possibilities with very precise targeting and pull out a possibility which we won't regret having made real, a friendly AI, loosely speaking. <clears throat> Note that we care about the self-improvement trajectory, not just the starting point. Gandhi doesn't want to kill people, so if you offer Gandhi a pill that makes him want to kill people, Gandhi will refuse the pill because he knows that if he takes the pill, he'll want to kill people, and then they'll die, and the current Gandhi doesn't want those people killed. That's probably how goals are preserved in a self-improving system. And I wish I could prove this, but the current math for decision theory doesn't work well for describing self-modifying AIs. The current math goes into an infinite loop when you try to describe the AI modifying the part of itself that does the modifying. So this is one of the open research problems that needs solving before anyone can build a friendly AI, and this is, in fact, what I see as my research objective. Um, <clears throat> but let's say that you solve the math problem. Now we get to the big question. What kind of friendly AI should you make? It's easy enough to describe all kinds of AIs you shouldn't make. Terminator, no. Agent Smith, no. HAL 9000, no. Now all these examples are fictional. They never actually happened. This is an important point to bear in mind. You don't want to fall prey to the logical fallacy of generalization from fictional evidence. <laughs> if, if you build an AI and everything works fine and you live happily ever after, it doesn't make a very interesting movie. Nonetheless, the classic cautionary tales do point up some interesting problems that emphasize the importance of certain kinds of laziness. One of the oldest cautionary tales about artificial intelligence, about uh, artificial agents, comes from the philosophy Velocities of Lucian in 150 CE, and you may have heard of it as the Sorcerer's Apprentice. A broomer in Lucian's original story, A Pestle, is, enchant is, en is enchanted to carry buckets and pour water into a cauldron, and the broom goes on doing this long after the cauldron is full. The apprentice wanted a cauldron full of water, but instead he made an artificial agent whose goal was to add water to the cauldron, a subtle but important difference. The apprentice did not ask for what he actually wanted. In philosophy, there is a distinction between terminal values, ends in themselves, and instrumental values, means to an end. Consider a heart transplant operation. When a surgeon opens up a patient, they're not cutting open the patient because they enjoy cutting people. And they're opening the patient to do a heart transplant. And they're not doing the heart transplant because they really like shuffling hearts around. They're doing it to save the patient. And then saving the patient's life is an end in itself, at least in my book. Now let's say you're creating an artificial moral agent to help with the heart transplant. You specify that the goal state is for the current heart to be outside the patient. Okay, the agent reaches in and rips the heart out. <laughs> no, no, you say. The goal state also requires the aorta to be intact and don't cut through this patient's spine either or remove the patient's legs to make them easier to lift. How do you know to specify all these fine little details of the goal state? How do you know not to cut the patient's spine? because you have a terminal value of improving the patient's health, and you know that cutting the spine will interfere with the patient's health. That's how you're generating all these complicated instructions. So the lazy way of solving this problem is to create an artificial agent that wants the same thing you want, to preserve the patient's health. If the agent wants the same kind of health you want, and it has a sufficiently good medical model of the patient, it will judge for itself that it shouldn't cut the spinal cord, and as usual here, the lazy way is more difficult. <clears throat> is it necessarily a good thing to have a powerful AI with the terminal value of keeping humans healthy? The classic story with folded hands by Jack Williamson is about AIs that try to keep humanity happy and safe. Happiness, safety, these are warm, fuzzy words. They generate good feelings in us. But Williamson's AIs put everyone into nice, safe nursery play pens and lobotomize anyone who isn't happy enough. Williamson's AIs had the terminal values of health and happiness. And who's against health and happiness? But Williamson's AIs didn't have terminal values for truth, 
justice, freedom, individuality, art, music, love, friendship, or any of the other things that we are happy about and stay alive for. The Folded Hands AI traded off security against freedom without caring about the other half of the equation, without having a term for freedom in their utility function. Just because health is a good thing doesn't mean that an ultra-powerful agent that only cares about health is a good thing. It could be extremely unpleasant to be around an ultra-powerful moral agent that shares only some, rather than all, of your terminal values. And I've probably got hundreds of terminal values. I can't print out the complete list any more than I can print out the positions of all the neurons in my cerebral cortex. The lazy solution would be a metamoral agent that looks at humans and figures out what their terminal values are. That might be an instruction you can specify more simply than just trying to describe the complete emotional makeup of humans. Or rather than trying to paint a picture, you polish up a mirror, and a mirror is a simpler thing than the picture. Don't paint all the tiny ethical details by hand. Make a metamoral mirror to reflect it all. And this involves moving into a different domain from ordinary morality, I should note. Another reason to be lazy is that human beings change their terminal values over time. If you write down your current morality in an AI, you are making into a fixed constant what ought to be a running process. An important thought experiment in thinking about this problem is to imagine that the ancient Greeks had discovered the principle of AI and set out to build an artificial moral agent. In ancient Greece, slavery was common and the status of women was not much higher. If ancient Greece had possessed the power to look through time, to see our own future, if they had been allowed to peek at us and decide whether we should be allowed to come into, an, into existence, they would have vetoed our civilization out of hand for some reason or other. The decay of mar martial virtue. We no longer rejoice properly in slaying our enemies in hand-to-hand -hand combat. What would the future have looked like if the ancient Greeks had had the capability to build a very powerful AI with their own moral values as fixed constants? This suggests that fixing your own moral values may be an extremely unwise strategy for building an AI, but, neither is it, but that doesn't mean it's wise to shrug and give up. Our civilization is not the same as ancient Greek civilization, but we are unmistakably their heirs. If it's not that Greek morals were tossed away and new morals rolled up by dice at random. The unpredictability of a superior intelligence is not like the unpredictability of rolling dice. We got here by following a pathway from there. If the Greeks had shrugged and said, we give up, we won't teach our children anything, it wouldn't have led to our future. Human beings are not perfect. But at least for now, it is only human beings who think this. It is we who have this conception that we are flawed. You will not find that judgment written upon the stars or mountains. They are not minds. They cannot think. It is we who have a sense of a direction that we are going in, and giving up, shrugging, will not push us forward in that direction. What we need is not to point an AI at our current values, but to point an AI at the moral trajectory we would follow over time. This is the advice we would, give to the, we would want to give to the ancient Greeks. Tell your AI to look where you're going, not just where you are now. Unless, of course, you want to live in Plato's utopia. There's not really much time on a cosmic scale that separates us from ancient Greece, just a paltry two and a half thousand years, and everyone now and then was human. Beyond the singularity is a much greater gap than the one that separates us from ancient Greece. What is at stake for us is also the future, and we too are not so wise. It turns out to be really hard to think of any way to build an AI that does not automatically doom the galaxy. It's a hard problem. We cannot try to set down the right path for our children and our children's children forever, because that is the path that leads to Plato's utopia. Whether you ask one person or take a vote, you are equally doomed. All of us together are not wise enough, no more than the ancient Greeks would have been. We cannot shovel the stars with our own hands. We need an ethical bulldozer. We need the search process, not our own culture's outputs. The AI needs to go where we're going, not where we are. This human world, in all its beauty and horrible mess, is the starting point. Our wish to be better people defines a direction. Our sense of our own imperfection provides the force that pushes us forward. But if we knew where we were going, 
we would already be there. So 